look up the word crazy in the dictionary and you might just find an asterisk beside the definition that says, listen to the Subiquitous podcast featuring Sue Duffield and you'll find out what crazy means. Sue's travelogue journey of unfiltered stories, impossible miracles, and faith-filled fun will be revisited right here. So buckle up and let's get going with this humorous travelogue of an unfiltered saint, Subiquitous. Sue reads her own book. She does. This is part two, and last week was chapters one and two, and this is chapter three. By the way, sidebar, each title has my name in it. This is chapter number three, Consucrate. I feel sorry for babies on overseas flights. I catch the eye of a little guy about three rows ahead. He's been restless the last hour or so, and I can relate. I'm restless, too. His mother, Miss Clueless, duh, (laughs) I'll call her, is pretty much letting him overtake the plane. Yoon must be sleeping or hiding in the Korean airliner's secret quarters. She is nowhere to be found. We have a brand new flight attendant this evening, and Shen is her name, and she is fast at work trying to comfort Mr. Squealmeister while pacifying the passengers. I watch her ask the baby's mom if she can hold him, and Shen leans in to pick up the little disgruntled boy, and as soon as she does, he settles right down. He gazes into her face and smiles. Shen is my new best friend. Shen is a pro. A few around me smile, too, nodding their heads while gesturing in a silent air-clapping motion. I nominate Shen to be this little boy's personal attendant for the rest of the flight. Now that it's back to the jet engine hum, I close my eyes and doze off. I'm falling in and out of consciousness, thinking about a dinner I sang and spoke at a few years ago for Child Evangelism Fellowship. The beautiful ballroom of the Registry Hotel was filled with unfamiliar supporters. You might find this surprising... And this is a little sidebar here. You're going to laugh. But I'm not the best small talk person in a formal setting. Jeff is so much better than me. It's weird. Everything I do is so public. But those kinds of events just stress me out. A room filled with suits and noxious perfumes and monotone chit-chat just about does me in. Now, Jeff shines in this kind of environment. And I'd rather go hide in the corner of the room or hallway to just watch and observe. That day, though, God knew I needed a subtle kick in the head. The CEF conference wasn't about my comfort. It was about the dedication and mission outreach that men and women devote to teach the gospel to children worldwide. And if there's one way to get my attention and pull me out of a corner, just start talking about reaching children with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I knew little about CEF at that point of the briefing, but when one of the keynote speakers began to talk about good news clubs around the world, I dropped my spoon to my plate. The slow motion clang startled everyone at the table, and in unison they all turned their heads from the speaker that was speaking and looked at me. My body might have been sitting in that velvet chair of the registry ballroom, but immediately my mind flashed back to summer days on Dixie Drive in New Jersey. It was 1961 when that little postcard announcement arrived in our mailbox saying, Good News Club is coming to your neighborhood. I ran into the house, skin, knees and all, waving the card in the air and shouting, I'm going, I'm going. The postcard was placed on the refrigerator underneath one of my mother's insurance agency magnets. The countdown to our little street's children's gathering was on. And the summer Bible club series was usually week long and was always held in the backyard of the house between Regional and Dixie Drive. My brother Dave and I could not wait to go. It was like an oasis of not really school in the summer. Many of the kids on our block went because we were bored and needed something to do. Friends, stories, songs, games, and snacks. (laughs) That's, That's exactly what I needed. We learned about Jesus, the flannel graph man. He tested the power of the flannel board in the wind. And we sang songs like, Stop, 
and let me tell you what the Lord has done for me. We even remember my, <laughs> yeah, we even memorized Bible verses. And of course, we always looked forward to the snacks like peanut butter crackers or Toll House cookies or Rice Krispie treats. There was nothing better in the world. So at that CEF conference, my 60s summer mind movie played the whole time the keynote speaker was presenting. Truth is, I wasn't really listening. I was reminiscing. But then he said something that was life-changing. He said, you know, there might be someone in this room right now who's been influenced by the gospel of Jesus through a summer Bible club. Our good news clubs were quite popular in the 60s and 70s. and every conference, we meet adults who, as children, found their way into someone's backyard to hear Bible stories. Is there anyone here that was influenced by a good news club? Well, <laughs> without hesitation, I shoved my hand into the air. And it wasn't my adult hand, but my six-year-old hand waving back and forth. And all I needed at that point was a Rice Krispie treat. I'm one, I said out loud as people turned around looking at me. You know, when you're raised in a Christian family and church is your entire life, it's hard to know exactly where or when you made a decision to follow Jesus. But that day I knew it all came back to me right there at that beautiful round table at the registry hotel. I gave God back his sacred space in my heart, the space he created in me for him when I was in Mrs. Wiley's backyard. It was then I knew I would consecrate my life to him forever. It was a very emotional moment for me. And I might have been sitting in a ballroom in that velvety chair in my nicest black dress as an adult, but my short little legs were swinging on the backyard swing underneath Mrs. Wiley's canopy in my mind. And after the session concluded and my table mates were filing out of the room, someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, Sue, our CEF president would like you to share your story about your Good News Club experience at the next session. Can you do that? Oh, my. First of all, I know this is a sidebar. You would laugh, but there are some things in my life that I've, I've never told publicly, and this was one. And I'm thinking, this will be so unrehearsed. Now, that in itself is funny. My whole career as a speaker and a singer for over 40 years has thrived on the unrehearsed. But my backyard experience would be a whole new soul, <laughs> new old story to the ears in that ballroom. It also would be a brand new confession from my lips to my own ears. And I motioned to the banquet staff, asking one of the waiters in a whisper, Hey, hey, you guys wouldn't happen to have a, a Rice Krispie treat, would you? <laughs> You can imagine the look I got considering we just were served fresh pecan-crusted Chilean sea bass and garlic-roasted asparagus and red raspberry white chocolate cheesecake. Very adult foods. Somehow, though, they located a Rice Krispie treat. Are you kidding me? And with that little manila-colored sticky confection in hand, I made my way to the platform. I shared about this Jesus, the flannel graph man, and how I consecrated my life to him at a Good News Club on Dixie Drive. The child in me attracts other children. It happens all the time. A little boy, maybe the only one in attendance at this very adult affair, stared at me the whole time I was speaking. He couldn't have been more than five years old. So intent was his attention that I was determined to take some time to find out who he was and what he was thinking about while I was talking. And I made my way down from the stage, put my hand out as if to shake hands, and he jumped into my arms and overcome with emotion. I whispered in his ear, you have no idea how you made my day. What a special young man you are. You made it pretty easy for me to tell this story today. And I was all emotional, the tears melting my mascara. And when he said, Miss Sue, I about fell out. I replied in a goofy, whimpering voice, yes, my little friend. <laughs> and he paused and he put his head back and said, your breath is really bad. Then he wiggled himself out of my arms and skipped away. Scoundrel. 
in my recent retreat speaking years, I have encountered something new. More young moms are bringing their infants and small toddlers to these events. And now I'm not a proponent of bringing young children to women's retreats only because I know that as a mom, you'll be spending more time in the hallways than in the sessions. I also know that the squabbles, the crying, and the disruptions can offend other attendees who paid big money to get away and learn too. So I don't blame them. It's also hard for a speaker to work with all the distractions. The other side of the story goes like this, though. Many of these young moms wouldn't be able to come without bringing their children, some by choice because some feel no one is qualified to watch their children, others by the fact that anyone they would even remotely trust to watch their children for the weekend are probably already here with them at the retreat. At one such retreat, Courtney, a busy little two-year-old, was quite a handful. Her mom, whom I loved instantly, was spending more time in the foyer and her hotel room than in any of the sessions. And she had all three of her children with her at this retreat. Her life was in crisis mode, and many around her knew this. But I was not aware yet. At least, not right away. Courtney was in the back of the ballroom just being a typical two-year-old, and I have to admit I was very close to frustration myself, knowing that the other women were as fatigued with the interruption as I was. I was oh so close to asking if someone would, would, would not mind taking her out to the foyer, but instead I just started to sing. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted you were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. I watched as Courtney separated herself from her mother and the child walked slowly up the center aisle toward me. I kept singing and got down on my knees to sing to her face to face. She didn't move and I stared into those pretty blue eyes while at the same time stroked her hair and tiny shoulders. It was a tender, divine, consecrated interruption, a sacred stop. The Holy Spirit had an agenda, and it was up to me to flow with it or lose it. Courtney, her mom, her family, and their situation needed a major miracle. And it was in that anointed pause that I believe God showed me something I needed to be shown. He showed me how to quit. And a little sidebar here, it never ends. God continues to show me when to stop. So today, quit trying to make things work. Quit trying to force things to happen. Quit being the manipulator and the orchestrator and let God direct the symphony. Quit being a controlling adult. And don't ever forget, that the childlike hunger for God lasts forever. That's what being consecrated is all about, being solely, S-O-L-E-L-Y, and solely, S-O-U-L-Y, solely His. Courtney and I, we sang together. We sang, Jesus loves me, and that singular moment of the retreat will never be duplicated. I'm not sure how effective my pre-planned topic was for that weekend, but I do know this. We were all sure that something special happened to us all. I know that all 150 women plus one little girl were deeply moved by the Spirit of God. I'm still not a proponent of bringing kids to women's retreats, but I got to say this. That sweet moment points and paints a superb picture of what the cutout Jesus on the flannel board would do to stop and be interrupted by children is to see the hand of Jesus at work. Praise God. Yes, interruptions are a real pain, aren't they? Wouldn't it be amazing if we all allowed ourselves to flow with godly peace, even when life is, is really out of control? Giving God sacred permission to barge in is to be forever consecrated to him. The child in me says, yes, because Jesus loves me. Driving the Pennsylvania Turnpike one day, during Mother's Day, in fact, I was away from my own kids, and I randomly interviewed travelers at the rest area. Sidebar here, I actually did this. 
<laughs> to every woman I would come in contact with, I said, Happy Mother's Day. And the reactions were priceless. Okay, it went like this. Me, Happy Mother's Day. And the woman turned around and looked at me and she said, Are you talking to me? Oh, I guess you are. <laughs> well, thank you then. <clears throat> I'm kind of sick. I said, Happy Mother's Day to another woman. And she said, Wow, that's nice. Thank you. My kids don't live around here, so thanks a lot. I said, Happy Mother's Day to another stranger. And she responded, Well, I don't have kids. I said, Well, that's okay. And she says, But I do have ovaries, so I guess there's hope, right? <laughs> I said, Yes, there's always hope. And the actual response from this woman says, I just have to write, find the right testicles. Yes, she did say that. And yes, I did put it in my book. Happy Mother's Day to another young woman. And this this guy was actually a gal, but I was not sure whether it was a girl or guy, I'll be honest with you, and it ends up being a boy. And, and he says back, you're kidding me, right? I went, oh gosh, I messed that one up big time. Happy Mother's Day to another woman with her adult child with special needs in a wheelchair. And she said, thank you. It's the best. And my girl is the best. And I said, yes, she is. Can I hug her? And the woman looked at me and said, yes, but be careful. She probably won't let go. <laughs> and I hugged her. And for sure, it took a few minutes to pry myself away. I looked at that mom that day on Mother's Day and I said to her, I said, you are a great mama. Thank you for being the best example yet of being a great devoted mom. And she said something back to me. Here I'm thinking, sidebar here, I'm thinking I'm encouraging her. This is what she said to me. You know what? We're moms. We do what we got to do. And we love our kids no matter what. <laughs> I'm never disappointed when I interview people. From all walks of life, these women and one interesting man, woman, I'm not sure what it was, just crack me up. Most people, if given the chance, show their true colors in less than a second. My mother's consecration to God was over the top, and I miss her so much. You would have, you would have loved Naomi Beatty. She was everything I am not. Petite, dainty, structured, disciplined. But she did instill in me the blessing of mothering and setting her children free. I'm so glad my kids give me hope that somewhere along the line I did something right. If you don't have children of your own, whether or not by choice, you have no less, in fact, you are no less of a person or no less of a woman. It's never too late to spiritually adopt children, taking them by the hand, mentoring and loving them like they're your own. I love being a woman with great potential to change the world. Let's do this. Bless a child today, whether you're genetically attached or not. Pour the investment of love into them, and even in pain and hardship or loss, wrap your arms around a wonderful child and a teenager, an adult baby, and lavish them with hope for their future. It's a very economical way to give a gift, yet so valuable and life-changing. My mother used to say, Mother's Day is a lot like Father's Day, except the presents are a lot more expensive. And justifiably so, in her case, she deserved the best. You know, I had to work through some challenges growing up on Dixie Drive, and as I grew older, I'm sad to say I didn't always live up to the consecrated life I wanted to have. Some bad choices as a young girl made for no perfection here, that is for sure. But my flannel graph Jesus still leaps off that board today. He's alive and living in my heart. Jesus called out to a child and stood him in the middle of the room saying, I'm telling you once and for all that unless you return to square one and start over like children, you're not even going to get a look at the kingdom, let alone get in. Whoever becomes simple and elemental again like this child will rank high in God's kingdom. And what's more, when you receive the childlike on my account, it's the same as receiving me. Matthew 18, verses 2 through 5. In the message. Here's a consecrated prayer. God, all your works will praise you. All your saints will praise you. I will speak of the glory of your kingdom. I will consecrate my life to you in childlike faith. Wake me every day with the majesty of your grace and forgiveness and awaken my heart for this earthly life to be more like you. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who leaps 
off a flannel graph board and into my heart. As I stir from a nap on this flight, I still see Shen walking the aisles with Mr. Squealmeister. She has much more patience than I do. I open one of the three books I brought with me, a leather-bound, worn-out, teal-colored book with Naoma Beatty embossed in gold on the front, my mother's Bible. It is a risk bringing this fragile Bible on the trip, but I had to. And on one of the first blank pages inside, my mother wrote, Pray for Carrie in Malaysia. I never saw that before. And I think to myself, I will, Mom. And I'm doing more than just praying for her. I'm going to see her and the rescued girls she has helped to rehabilitate, and I'm taking you with me. You're with me, Mom, I say softly under my breath. You're with me. Chapter 4. Surround. Keiko Matsui, an amazing jazz pianist, is playing her magic in my headphones. And I found her while scanning all the satellite radio channels on this Korean airliner. I cannot tell you how euphoric this is for me. I'm surrounded by smells, sounds, and tastes that are everything Sea Asian. Most of the 300 or so passengers are Korean, and I love being the minority. May leans into me and whispers, The warm towel's coming! The warm towel's coming! And sure enough, as soon as she says this, another flight attendant I haven't yet met hands me a warm, moist towel with silver tongs from a silver bowl. What do I do with this, May? You wash your face and hands, and don't forget to put on slipper. Take shoe off. We are supposed to sleep now, and when we wake, we eat Korean sweet cake, much like American donut, but way better. And May puts her head back and laughs. She knows she's got me wrapped around her little finger. I so want to capture all this on video, but instead I write in my journal. And as I write, I'm thinking about how to stay connected with May, my new and hopefully lifetime friend. A few years ago, my best friend Dawn and I were skipping, and we were having a great time hiking, and then one day we decided to Skype, and, and we made it quite a scene at the Detroit Metro Airport. And she was at her house in western Michigan, and I at a seat in Terminal A. And we were both howling in laughter at our screens, thinking back to the time she tripped and fell in the mud on a rainy Sunday morning. Dawn was wearing a beautiful black Casper suit she just bought at Macy's, and running through the parking lot to escape the torrential downpour, we made an impulsive decision and attempted to jump over a flower bed near the church entrance. The key word here was attempt. Dawn fell flat in the mud and I was stumbling behind her. Well, I just lost it. And thankfully she wasn't hurt, but I was immobilized and bent over with crippling laughter. A little sidebar here. Let me just tell you something. There is nothing that kills me more that it will literally immobilize me is, is watching YouTube and watching special <laughs> events on television where people fall. I don't know, maybe because I fall a lot. It was as if I'd been shot with a stun gun. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't breathe. I was laughing so hard. I was trying to help her up, but every time I grabbed her hand, I collapsed in a weakened, crazed state. Drenched Presbyterians dashed right by us into the dry shelter of the church, knotted up in hysterics. We could barely make it inside. We dashed to the ladies' room and tried scrubbing mud off her suit and my shoes, but mud was everywhere, in her hair, behind her ears, even in her underwear, and wet paper towels only made it worse. Dawn wasn't laughing nearly as much as I was at this point, but it was quite the scene. Women who had just arrived at church surrounded the ladies' room, snickering as though they witnessed this muddy prelude to the service. Morning worship was soon to start, and I was the singer-speaker for the day, and all that laughter was a spurt of healing joy for me. How in the world do you gather your composure after an experience like that? First of all, you can't, or at least I couldn't. I have had many experiences of consuming belly laughter, and once on a very turbulent plane, 
I drank one too many cups of water. I needed to use the laboratory in the worst way. And the plane was packed. It was only a matter of time before the seatbelt fastened light would be illuminated. I had the window seat in a row just behind first class. And of course, I had to bother the young couple next to me to let me out. The lavatory at the front of the plane was not working, so I had to weave to the one at the back of the plane. I was wearing a pretty little summer dress, and that's rare. Most times when traveling, I wear jeans or comfy clothes, but my daughter Annie, who is my fashion police, and a little sidebar here, she still tries to tell me what to wear, insists I should dress a little more feminine and age-appropriate. The turbulence was getting worse, so I rushed to do what I needed to do. I entered the potty cubicle. As soon as I sat down, the pilot said, of course, all passengers, please report to their seats immediately. Flight attendants, secure your positions. Great. I quickly jumped up, burst out of the door, and fast-trotted the, fast the entire length of the plane with my dress stuck in my granny panties. That's right. No one person stop me to inform me i guess they figured with all the turbulence a crazed woman exposing her rear was the least of their worries i got to my row and rather than ask the couple to get up out of their seats to let me in i motioned to them and said don't worry just sit i'll crawl over you little sidebar here this is what it was sounded like it sounded like excuse me pardon me excuse me pardon me excuse me pardon me <laughs> that's what i did they sat there while i hobbled in front of them and with my exposed you-know-what in their faces. It's when I collapsed in my seat and felt the cold leather, I realized, dear God, I have absolutely blown it. I knew that sensation is unmistakable, that my dress was stuck in my underwear. The gal next to me said flippantly, I was going to say something to you, but I didn't know what to say. I stared straight ahead and answered back. Well, by the time I got to you, it was a little too late anyway. And I bent over to get my purse, and when I did, everything came tumbling out of it. Gum, lipstick, cleanuts pack, tums scattering everywhere. My business card holder landed over by the man sitting across the aisle. He picked it up, and the cards came flying out. He gathered them up and held one in his hand to read it, and he looked at me and said, Wow, are you in show business? <laughs> and there was a long pause. And I exhaled and said, Yes, as of today, in fact, I... I just showed my business. <laughs> True story. It's not surprising to me anymore that the women I meet, especially over our recent series of Laugh Out Loud, Live Out Loud, because he's Lord of Lords, LOL, themed retreats, girls' night out, and chocolate and chuckle events that I do, they've had incredibly gripping faith stories. You wouldn't think it, but it happens. Stories that aren't very neat and clean, believe it or not. From atheists to crack addicts and former prostitutes on parole, I feel like Dorothy when she said to Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. Kansas for me, in this metaphor, used to mean well-groomed, shiny-faced, picture-perfect June Cleaver women who do church, have church and live church. You know, the churchy women. You know, the squeaky clean, non-messy religious ladies get-togethers that rank right up there with Martha Stewart hospitality goodness. That's what it used to be. Until, until I started praying for revival and outreach like never before. I started to take note that through the promotion of comedy and humor, women show up. Some come without any pew-sitting background at all, no church history. Hope Healing, laughter, and encouragement are quite the draw, and I'm totally surrounding myself, S-U-E, surrounding myself with all of this. I grip the left hand of a 13-year-old girl who's been cutting herself. But once the words to my crazy acronym texting song, LOL, and at the same time, I grab the right hand of an 89-year-old woman who said out loud, my heart has been so heavy for so long. You have no idea. I needed to laugh so badly tonight. Thank you. I see a lot of joy and fun in women's events around the world, but I also see distance, anxiety, hurt, and lack of trust too. Laughter can and will actually expose more about who you are than you may realize. And readying myself for a recent LOL retreat, I wrote this in my journal. What you laugh about defines you. What you cry about refines you. What you pray about assigns you. And what you give to God 
aligns you. Laugh, cry, pray, give. Four power-packed action verbs that will keep you centered. Surround yourself with friends who love to laugh. Surround yourself with friends who cry. Surround yourself with prayer partners, especially the interceding ones who pray without ceasing, with fervor every day in the middle of the night, whenever prompted at all times of the day. Surround yourself with giving generous people and hang with those who feed you, not bleed you. Praise God. Don't go one day without scheduling some sort of fun. Did you know that we are spiritually wired to smile? You were designed to enjoy a good belly laugh and see the humor in all things. My husband Jeff knows I can't go one day without teasing him in some way. Little sidebar here, I just did it a few few minutes ago. It brings me such joy. He says potato, I say potato, he say granola bar. No, I say granola bar. He says Snickers. Mm -hmm. I needle him constantly about his peculiar subpar no greens diet. He says I eat bark. I say he's content to drink sweet tea and eat M&M peanuts his whole life. We joke constantly about food. I'll say to him, would you like to taste this (laughs) pimento mousse hummus filled with shallots and dill? And he'll say I'd rather eat the package. It's therapeutic. And it sure keeps things fresh around our house. And our adult children, David and Annie, have the humor gene, too. It's an errand. And the thing they find the most fun these days, you know what it is? It's to make fun of their mother. My kids tell me I never really listen to them or I filter it when I do listen. They do get my attention, though, when they call me Susie. Whatever I do... (laughs) It seems like that gets my attention. The smartest, easiest way to care for your own well-being is to surround yourself with those who have a positive approach in life. Lean in, learn, and receive from those who understand holy humor and live life to the fullest every day. Contagious laughter in abundance in your soul opens your heart. It's like a reboot or restart on a computer. And if you laugh so hard you can't catch your breath, Oh, my word. This is another book someday. The medicinal benefits abound. It can actually restore and cleanse your body. It's just like God to make something so trivial as laughter to have power like medicine. Laughter opens the door. And that was a song that I wrote. And it's the most covert, evangelistic, and most amazing tool out there. It works every time. Take my new atheist friend who returned to hear me for the second time in two years. True story. She approached me at the end of a recent concert. Here's what she said. Hi, Sue. I didn't agree with all your religious talk or what your song and your stuff, you know, about Jesus tonight. I didn't flinch. I didn't act surprised. I smiled and said, that's okay. You came. You know what? I probably wouldn't think you would agree with me as I probably wouldn't agree with you at your meetings either dead silence then she says my sister made me come the first time but I came back on my own this time and I'm sure she expected a typical judgy response I said that's really cool Mary you know Mary wasn't engaging in much eye contact but that was okay she continued I liked it when you sang the oldies and I really liked the comedy and stuff and I really liked your stepping out song but the Jesus part not so much I put my hand out to shake hands, and she grabbed it. I couldn't believe it. Thanks, Mary, for being honest, I said. This same Jesus that sings and speaks through me during the oldies and all that crazy humor is also the same Jesus who cares very deeply for you. And since he lives inside of me, he's got your hand right now. Little sidebar here. She looked at me, (laughs) and I couldn't believe the expression. She looked at my hand, then up at me, and smiled and just turned away. I don't know what happened in her heart, but I surrounded her with Jesus in that moment. One of my favorite Facebook posts from a woman attending a church here in Nashville. When she checked in and wrote a status update, she inadvertently checked in to the Hooters restaurant that was right across from her church. And she wrote, in his presence at Hooters. 
Her friend's comment under the status update was just as good. Girl, you better cross that street. You see, I believe God gives us a communicable, funny disease. But my strain is more of a dizzy ease. It's infectious, transmittable, <laughs> and very influential. I'm always in search of true-to-life stories with a spontaneous kid-like frolic. Not that I really have to search. They tend to find me, actually. And laughter is the supernatural drug that costs nothing but is priceless to a sick body or soul. People are drawn to happy people. I grew up in a home where laughter was the norm, and it is my intent to keep the generational blessing alive and well. For all my social media friends and experts out there who post on a regular basis, let me help you with something. Don't be so super spiritual. Try to ease off the judgment a little. Don't express hatred through sarcasm and do invite others into your conversation. Applaud, praise, and comment on posts that are worthy of your approval. Be communicable in the best of ways. Revel in your shortcomings. You know, you never look better to the world than when you are real, vulnerable, and not taking yourself so seriously. Sophie, a little friend I met in an event, her mom brought her to, doesn't smile much, and she'll turn six years old soon and she's missing some teeth. Last time I saw her, I said, oh dear Sophie, your new teeth will grow fast. You'll draw more people when you smile. She looked at me dumbfounded and said, you mean if I smile, I can draw people? I can't draw people too good. I can draw trees and horses better. You want to draw with me? <laughs> that cracked me up. She picked up a brown crayon and drew a picture of me, and when she handed it to me, I chuckled because I looked like a horse. <laughs> she smiled big time and said, You told me to draw you, and I drew you. Right, Miss Sue? Yes, baby girl, you drew me all right. I love the teeth. <laughs> Atmosphere and engagement with any audience starts with you, whether online or in person. And the truth is, I don't make the distinction or consider a difference between being real in person or public or online. It's so easy to hide behind the computer screen. Or I should say, the computer screen. <laughs> or even live a life of make-believe. But eventually, you'll find out. Sooner or later, our posts, treats, and status updates reflect what we're really about. It doesn't take long for our true personalities to seep through the Internet. I have to unfollow some people purely because their posts irritate me and they don't speak life to me. Have you done that? I sure have. It's so much healthier to surround yourself with people who are consistent in their vision and their positive outlook on life. You know, I... And you know me well, and here's a sidebar, you know this for sure. I try to do stupid stuff, and I purposely post ridiculous stories about myself just to get responses. I want to see who's paying attention. So the other day I posted this on Facebook. I have tried 20-plus deodorants in the past several months, all to combat this change-of-life hormonal desperation to not smell like used kitty litter. Well, I finally found Tom's natural, long-lasting apricot deodorant. Awesome. Now I smell like apricot-scented used kitty litter. And I hashtagged, I thought you would enjoy this. <laughs> As you can imagine, the comments rolled in. I laughed because some of them took me seriously prescribing all kinds of remedies. But most of them posted LOL and laughing over here. I cannot stress to you how critical it is to resist the temptation to be negative online. Give and share the healing power of your hilarious moments encoded with the magnet of the gospel. Draw them in. Then when their ears and hearts are open wide, you have the open air space to deliver your message. Just love them, for goodness sake. Psalm 109, 30 and 31 from the message nails it. My mouth's full of great praise for God. I'm singing his hallelujahs, surrounded, emphasis mine, by crowds. For he's always at hand to take the side of the needy, to rescue a life from the unjust judge. Surrounded by crowds. It sure sounds to me like crowds will follow those who sing his hallelujahs and those whose mouths are full of great praise. I wish we could grasp this concept. We attract others more when we get rid of our own pious presence and envelop others with his presence. 
of surround prayer. Father God, help me to be a laughter light to a critically dark world. Engage me to be more like you so when I am with others, they will see your presence. Surround your Holy Spirit in my home and in my family and help me with my attitude and servitude. Instruct my mouth to tell of your righteousness. Thank you, God, for turning my mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, into dancing. Sure enough, like clockwork, this aromatic, puffy Korean pastry delight arrives right under my nose like some glorious olfactory alarm clock. I open my eyes and behold this glorious presentation of Fred, <laughs> fresh raspberry, not Fred raspberry, fresh raspberries. I, I got so excited. And sugary pastry on a china plate. And May motions to me as if I need coercing to try it. Then she says, trust me, Mrs. Sue, you forget all about American Donut when you teeth into that. And I chuckled to myself at her English when you teeth into that. Love it. That's chapter three and four of this ubiquitous book, A Humorous Travelogue of an Unfiltered Saint. On our next edition, it'll be chapter five and six. And in the meantime, if you'd like to have any comments, questions, criticism, whatever comes your way, send me an email at radiosue at me.com. And you can also get on our website, sueduffield.com. And a wonderful way to keep this ministry going is by using Patreon. Patreon is a wonderful platform of great friends supporting each other. And I promise you this, we are at an amazing download feature right this past month. And we are so grateful for those that are watching and listening to all of our online presence. But I want to specifically thank you for being a patron. And you can do that by getting on Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com forward slash Sue Duffield. We'll see you next week.